Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we resume our study in verse number 1. Get your Bible, open it up to 1 Corinthians 15. Let's have a Bible study. Let's study the Word of God together with you and your Bible and me and mine and we'll have a good time in God's Word. Good time guaranteed by the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher. If you want to study the entire Bible with me, from Genesis through Revelation, at your pace and at your convenience, you can do that anytime at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. And all you have to do is choose from one of the four series going through the Bible, three complete series, choose whatever series, choose whatever book or begin in the beginning, go all the way through the end, click and listen, and we can study God's Word as much as you want. That's at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and in which ye stand. And so here God is going to remind us what the gospel of salvation really is. He's going to cut through all the tinsel, all the confusion, and get right to the heart of the matter. And that reminder of what the gospel of salvation is, is needed today as much as it has ever been needed. Charlatans, false teachers, false prophets, have been twisting the message of salvation for over 2,000 years. But there's only one true message concerning how to be saved from hell, and we have it right here, and it does not change. Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus said, but my word will not pass away. So he says in verse 2, by which also, talking about that gospel, by which also, ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. It is amazing how many preachers, modern-day evangelicals and others, skip over that little but huge word, if. But it's there. And Jesus said not one jot or tittle. That's a crossing of a T and a dotting of an I and a comma and a parenthesis will not pass away. So we better look at it. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. What does it mean to believe in vain? Many people say they believe in something, but if they don't act in accordance with what they say they believe, they are phonies. They believe in vain. Their so-called beliefs are useless. They're vain <clears throat> because they don't affect them in any way. They don't move them. They don't control them. And likewise, for a person to believe the facts about Jesus Christ without repenting and asking him to be their Lord and Savior is to believe it's not that there's no belief there, of course. They believe, but it is to believe in vain because those beliefs are useless. If you believe something, but you don't act on it, well, you believe it. But your belief is in vain. It doesn't do you any good. If you believe the facts about Jesus, you believe. You're a believer. But if you don't do what the facts tell you to do, which is to repent and receive him as Lord and Savior. Yeah, you believe, but you believe in vain. It doesn't do you any good. It's vain. It's worthless. That's kind of, that kind of belief is absolutely worthless. 
It's on the level of the devil and the demons because they all believe. <clears throat> so the Bible, the Bible says that faith without good works that coincide with one says they believe cannot save. Faith without works is dead. The faith that changes one's eternal destiny also changes the way they live here on earth. And according to Jesus himself, a person must take that next step, which is to turn away from sin and with all sincerity ask him to be the Lord of their life and to forgive them. Verse 3. Here we go. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. You know, Paul was a good teacher, a good Bible teacher faithful because he delivered what he received no more no less he believed in fasting prayer and study which are ways to stay close to god and if you close if you if you if you're close to god you're more likely to hear from him so he did those things he did those things that kept him close to god so that he could receive more from god now let's also add to Paul's situation that he was inspired of the Holy Spirit to write the scriptures that he wrote. So that was a special gift that was given him. But for all of us, we have to stay close to God so that we can receive from him, so that we can in turn deliver what we have received to others and be useful. So Paul did that, and then he delivered what he heard from God to the people without watering it down. See, he delivered what he received. Some preachers and teachers do not deliver what they have received. They deliver what they have conceived. They think of things in their own mind. And those things are very often things that will benefit them and make them popular. And then they teach those things as facts. They don't deliver what they have received. They deliver what they have conceived. Good Bible teachers study the Word of God and then from that draw out commands, promises, and principles which come from God. That's what Paul did. And that's what should be done today. If you're going to teach the Word of God, that's what you should do. No more, no less. So look at three again. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. God warned Adam that in the day that he sinned, he would die. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. So people die because of their own sins every single day. And you know what? Their death doesn't do them anything or anyone else any good because man's death is just a consequence of sin. They're getting what they've got coming, physical death. That's only part of what they've got coming, but that's what they get. <clears throat> There's no efficacy in their death. It's a consequence of their sin. So what we need is someone who doesn't have any sins of their own to die for, and who is willing to die in our place for our sins. Jesus did that for us. He was sinless, and he volunteered to die and pay for our sins. That is the central truth of the gospel. Jesus paid for our sins. He became the sin offering for our sins. Look at 3 and 4 together. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, <clears throat> the death of Jesus Christ satisfied the justice of God. God's justice had to be satisfied. Sin had to be paid for, and death was the only thing that could pay for sin. So, his justice had to be satisfied. Someone had to pay for our sins because God could not simply overlook them. 
He was incapable of simply overlooking our sin because part of his essential nature is that he is just and he does not act, he cannot act contrary to his own character and his own perfection. So Jesus took the punishment that our just God had to dish out and had to be paid by someone, someone capable, someone who had never sinned themselves so that they could act as a substitute, which was Jesus. His death on the cross paid for our sins, and his resurrection proved that he was sinless and therefore qualified to pay for our sins. Now, watch this. If the wages of sin is death, and it is, God says so, then if Jesus had sinned, he would have stayed dead just like the rest of us after he was crucified. But he didn't stay dead because he never sinned. He was simply offered as a sacrifice, a sin offering, a trespass offering to pay for our sins. So when Jesus came back from the dead, as he said he would, that proved that he was qualified to pay for our sins because he had none of his own to pay for. That is one of the great significances about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is God's stamp of approval on his sacrificial death. If he doesn't, if Jesus doesn't come back from the dead, then we have absolutely no hope that our sins are paid for. So that's part of the gospel. The gospel includes the death of Christ on the cross, which paid for our sins, the resurrection of Christ, which proved that he paid for our sins. And then we move on to verse 5. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present time. But some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James and of the apostles. So, as I have just stated, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not just a nice thing that happened to Jesus. It is absolutely essential to prove that his sacrifice on the cross paid for our sins. Again, let me reiterate, it took the sinless Son of God to die as a substitute in payment for our sins. If Jesus ever sinned, even one time, he never would have been raised from the dead because the wages of sin is death. But he did come back, proving that he was sinless, proving that his death was able to pay for our sins because he was a sinless substitute. Consequently, to prove that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was real, and not just a made-up thing. Paul, in effect, is saying, I can give you the names of nearly 500 witnesses who saw him after he came back from the dead, and they will tell you that they saw him after he came back. That's a pretty big testimony. In addition to the apostles, who all died for their testimony that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead physically, bodily. Now, you might find a couple of people who would agree to lie about the resurrection of Christ and stick with it. You might find a couple of people who are willing to do that. I doubt that you could get 11 people, like the 11 apostles, to agree on a lie about the resurrection of Christ and stick with it? I, I don't believe you could get 11 like the apostles, and there is no way on earth that you could get 500. No way at all. Especially when these eyewitnesses were brutally tortured and put to death because they proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If it was a lie they would have bailed out rather than be tortured. If they were not truly eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 
If for some unknown reason they made the whole thing up, their false testimony would come to a screeching halt when their head was on the chopping block for saying that they saw Jesus alive after he had been murdered. But that didn't happen. They were all sure. They testified to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and they took their lumps for doing it. Verse 8, And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. So long after the other white witnesses saw the risen Christ, Paul did as well. And he says that he was born out of due time, which may mean that he didn't believe in Christ before the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. While the other 11 apostles and the rest of the eyewitnesses were preaching Christ, Paul was killing Christians. So he was very fortunate, number one, that Jesus saved him from hell, and number two, that he didn't completely miss out on seeing the risen Christ. And therefore, he was a valid witness as well. <clears throat> Verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles, that am not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. You know, you got some memories that you just can't get past. You know you're forgiven. Maybe you didn't get saved until a little later on in life. And you committed some horrible sins. And, you know, you wish you could do it all over again, but you can't. And you're forgiven. God has forgiven you through Jesus Christ. But you still remember it. And it still dogs your memory. Well, you can tell that Paul's former life haunted him even long after he repented and received Christ. And after all the work that he did for Jesus, those memories still remained. And this is in part what God is talking about when he says that he's not mocked. Sin has consequences, and God's holiness will not be mocked by allowing people to get away with their sin. Memory of what? Paul did to Christians, did not send him to hell, thankfully, but those memories plagued him until his death. One of the temporary consequences of our sin is that we remember them after we have confessed and they are a source of grief to those of us who love Christ. Verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Did you ever hear a Christian counselor or a so-called Christian psychologist or sadly Christian pastors and Bible teachers and preachers say that you need to build up your self-esteem or you can never be used by God. You need to work on that self-esteem. You know, that is the biggest bunch of nothing that has ever been spewed out of the ungodly mouth of a psychologist, Christian or non-Christian, counselor, Christian or non-Christian, preacher, Bible teacher. That is spiritual rot. It's not true. The Apostle Paul did not have a good self-image. He had a horrible self-image. He's talking about it right here. He didn't think he was anything good. He said he was the worst of all sinners. Don't tell me you've got to have a good self-image. You know who tells you that kind of stuff? Preachers and pastors who want to come across as being intellectuals, sophisticated, and they don't want to deal with the real issue, which is the Word of God. So they, they, they major on that kind of stupidity, intellectual stupidity, because it sounds so good. Wow, so much better than them. Fundamentalists, especially those who use the King James, who believe that the Bible has been preserved and they speak it with authority as a result...
You got to have a good self-image before you can be used by God. I've heard that so many times. It makes me nauseous to think about it. So I don't listen to Christian radio anymore. It's all over the place. When I first got saved, Christian radio was, was very good. It was Bible-centered. All the old timers who began ministries back in the 30s, radio pioneers, were getting up there. But before they retired, man, they were chewed to the Word of God and it was pure Bible teaching. Others took over and took their place and it went downhill. Many, many, many cases it went downhill quickly. And you're left with foolishness. The Apostle Paul did not have a good self-image, but he used it to his spiritual advantage. You see that in verse 10. When you really know deep down in your soul that you don't deserve eternal life, when you don't forget those rotten, forgiven, but rotten sins that you committed, and you love Jesus, it makes you feel like dirt. And you know that you don't look too good to God by yourself. You don't look too good to yourself because of your past sins. Although you know they're forgiven, they still make you feel rotten about yourself, and you should feel rotten about yourself because it's true. But when you know deep down in your soul that you don't deserve eternal life, but that Jesus saved you from hell by paying for your sins anyway, he did it anyway, you know what it's going to do? If you love Jesus, you know what it's going to do? It'll do what it did for the Apostle Paul. You'll go all out for living for Christ out of appreciation and thankfulness. It's not about you. It's not, who cares if you don't feel good about yourself? What does that have to do with anything? You shouldn't. That's nothing to do with anything. Be honest. Have an honest evaluation of yourself. And then love Jesus all the more for accepting you because of what he did for you on the cross and serve him out of love and appreciation. I'm so grateful that Jesus saved me. I am a horrible sinner. It makes me sick, the things that I have done. I have an honest evaluation of myself. It doesn't paralyze me spiritually. It makes me go all out all the more for Jesus or want to. Out of appreciation and love. How can you love someone like me? I gotta serve. I can't help but serve you, Jesus. Out of appreciation for accepting me. In the beloved, as the Bible says, if you really understand what Jesus did for you, then no price is too high to pay in order to please your Savior. And that's why Paul was willing to suffer so much for Jesus. And he didn't take any credit for his dedication either. He gave all the credit to God, even for his dedication. God's grace enabled him to be sold out for Jesus. I tell God every single day, Lord, if anyone ever gets anything out of these messages, if anyone is ever edified, taught, rebuked, encouraged, drawn closer to Jesus, if I ever get a, a, a note of encouragement, an offering or anything... It's all because of you. I tell him that every single day because I believe it with all my heart. And he deserves to be told that. Anything bad we do is our fault. Anything good we do is by God's grace and his enablement. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. And that's what spurred him on to live so zealously for Jesus Christ. 11. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so ye believed. It didn't matter which apostle did what or maybe suffered the most to bring the word of God to Corinth. The important thing for the Corinthians is that they welcomed the word and they responded to it by receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and were saved as a result. That's the important thing. Who brought them the message was not important. Every Christian should want to do the most that they possibly can do for Jesus 
and live the best life that they possibly can, not for their own glory, not to be noticed, not to become popular, not anything to do with self, but for the glory of Jesus Christ. Who does what in the church does not matter. Live for Jesus. Let your focus, your soul focus be on pleasing him, period. Out of love. That's another thing I pray every day. And I pray that I pray that for all my listeners too. God help us to serve you and to live a holy life because we love you. Because you're so good. And that's the important the important thing for us, each one of us, is to stay close to Jesus so that God's will can be done through us and in our lives. See? If that happens, Christ is going to be pleased, which really is the only thing that matters. And the result is going to be good. 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, you can say that you don't believe there will be a resurrection from the dead because it's impossible? You say that. Once you're dead, you're dead. Can't come back. You can say that if you want to. But the evidence is overwhelming that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, bodily, physically, three days after he died, just as he said multiple times that he would be. There is enough evidence to prove the resurrection of Jesus Christ in any court of law. And so, believe it or not, resurrection has happened and will happen again. You say, but, but I can't wrap my mind around that. Resurrection is something that I cannot fathom. Well, God's not limited by your mind. He's not limited even by your imagination. The Bible says that all things are possible with God. And that same Jesus who said that he would be raised after three days and it came to pass, that same Jesus who said he would be raised after three days also said that he would raise us from the dead on the last day. So you, if you're a Christian, you're coming back. And if you're not a Christian, you're coming back. Jesus said, everybody who's in the grave is going to hear the voice of the Son of Man. On that day, some will be raised unto eternal death in the lake of fire. Others will be raised unto eternal life. So you're coming back, whether you believe it or not. Some of you who doubt the Word of God, that doesn't matter. Your puny little mind doesn't alter God's truth. You're coming back whether you believe it or not. The thing is, if you don't repent and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you will be raised from the dead and then be thrown into hell with your brand new physical body that will never die and that will feel every ounce of pain that hell can dish out. And it is infinitely worse than any amount of pain that you've ever experienced in this life. Imagine if you can, sticking your hand and your arm into some into a into a deep fryer with hot grease imagine sticking your hand and your arm in that and not being able to pull it out now imagine your whole body being in something like that and it never ever ends that's what hell is for those who reject Christ on the other hand those who receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and choose to follow him will come back from the dead as well but it's going to be great because they'll come back to live in glory to live in peace to live in joy and happiness on this planet and in fact the entire universe so the choice is yours you can believe it you can disbelieve it you can reject Christ and pay the consequences or you can receive Christ and follow him and enjoy the consequences totally up to you out of time continue studying with me at the bibleversebyverse.com Remember, I'm not underwritten by large church or denomination. So if you want to be a part of this ministry, 
click the donate button at the top of the front page at the bibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead and also pray for me, would you? Pray for the word of God. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.